give a brief 30-minute well, talk on design and implementation of a flexible application architecture using Laravel 4. Um, the four main pieces that I'll go over, uh, first I'll give a little bit basics of Laravel, where to get it, where you can find it. Um, then I'll go through a base of uh, architecture strategy, which could really be applied to any programming language. Um, but the examples that I give will be specific to Laravel 4. Uh, then I'll go to the base Laravel application that you can get from GitHub. And then I'll move to changing that around so that the application is a little bit more flexible and usable for years down the road. So basically the fourth step is implementing what we go through in the second step. So for Laravel 4, um, the tagline that goes along with it is PHP framework for web artisans. Um, you can <laughs> yeah, that's a little, anyway. Uh, you can find more information on laravel.com. Uh, that's where you'll find the documentation, links to their GitHub rep repo. Uh, Laravel IO, which would be the community site. So the forums, uh, link to IRC chat. Um, that's probably your best resource for community help. Uh, GitHub has a lot of resources for Laravel, uh, whether it's packages or tutorials or little snippets of code that relate to Laravel 4. And then also there's several good walkthroughs and tutorials on NetTude Plus um, where you can find more information on how to develop with Laravel 4. So on to the architecture strategy that I'll go through. Uh, what we're going to go through is the solid principles. Uh, single responsibility principle so is the S, open close principle, list call of substitution principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. Um, why use uh, a bunch of principles that don't really make sense yet? Um, the main reason is developing an application that's clean, testable, and reusable so that you're not re-architecting what you do today three months from now. So on single responsibility principle, each piece of your application should have one responsibility and one responsibility only. Uh, the quote that goes along with this is, there should never be more than one reason for a class to change. Uh, way, another way to put this would be, say you have a user model class, and I ask you to describe that user model class. And the description goes something like this. My user model, connects with the database, pulls database, ba database information back, uh, it also validates the user, and then maybe authenticates the user. All three of those pieces should really be separate classes. They shouldn't be necessarily one user model class. You should really separate those concerns into multiple classes. And so that's <coughs> what the single responsibility principle is essentially saying. So the examples that I'll go through for solid all relate back to a site that I developed back in January, uh, before Laravel 4 was released, called trekweather.com. So this site is a site that allows you to see what the best time is to visit whatever country you're looking to visit. So say you're trying to visit South America, you would click South America, and the, the countries that are blue, you'd want to visit in, say, December or January or February, or whenever you're planning. Um, but this was developed back in January. So we're going to take an example from this, um, though it's a little pseudocode right now, this isn't exactly what's on the site, but this is more to demonstrate the different principles as we work through them. So what we have here is a map generator class, and the Trek Weather site uses JavaScript to display this map. And that those JavaScript files are generated on the back end. And so this map generator class is in charge of doing that, specifically the generate function. So you have the base path, it's getting some months, it's looping through those months, um, putting it into a variable, and then outputting that to the file system. And then below that you see a function that's spitting back the get months. So the first part is really doing the work, and then the second function really doesn't quite belong there. So what we're going to do is separate those pieces of data retrieval. So we'll separate it into a country, country repository, and a month repository. So now the country repository is in charge of getting that data from the database, and the month repository is in charge of getting the months. 
this is twofold. Um, one is separating those concerns, and then also, if you were to use the get month somewhere else, you wouldn't have to instantiate this generator class, which really you shouldn't need to do if you wanted those months. So now you can instantiate this month repository and get those months. So if we go back to the, the map generate class, um, you'll see the constructor is injecting in the law of a four way of injecting an interface, the country and the month, and then assign it to a class variable. And then the generate function has now changed. We've removed the, the function from below. We're calling the this month get months from the, the month class. And then below that, you'll see the country class is using the uh, get countries. So we removed those two dependencies that were in the class. So the next principle we'll go through is the open close principle. Um, the quote that goes along with this is, software entities should be open for extension, but not modification, but closed for modification. So one way to think about this is if you have a change request come in and you think about it whether it's a bug or not. So is it a bug, is it not? If it's a bug, then you're going to have to modify the class. But if it's not a bug, you should be able to extend your class to add that new, new functionality. There's a duck in the room. <laughs> so an, ex an example with the uh, map generator class is you notice that file put contents, which is saving that JavaScript variable to the file system. But what if you decided you didn't want to put it to the file system anymore? You wanted to stick it up into S3, or maybe you wanted to do both. Maybe you want to stick it up to S3 and you wanted to store it locally. You'd have to come into the generate class and make those modifications and throw in a for loop and uh, basically hard code those di different uh, storage mechanisms. So we want to remove that. So we'll develop a storage interface with a store function, which is essentially the only thing that this storage uh, method needs. And then we'll have the two classes that we need. So we have an S3 storage, and again, this is kind of pseudocode, so don't go run this in production or something. Um, and then there's a uh, file storage, which is stored into the file system. <coughs> so implementing that, you'll see again in that constructor, we've added another parameter, which is an array of the storage me mechanisms we want. And then below that, we've changed the generate <coughs> function at the bottom to loop through those storage mechanisms. So now we have the for each going through each of the storage mechanisms and then calling that store function, which we're guaranteed to have since we have the interface guaranteeing to us that it's, it's going to exist. And then you'll see over on the right side, uh, this is a Laravel 4 specific thing, the apt bind. So what we're doing there is binding um, the map generator to this implementation. So it's returning the new map generator it's calling the interfaces and then the sending an array of the storage mechanisms we're going to use. So in our code, whenever we would call map generator, it's going to use the stuff that's in the upper right. So the next principle is the Liskov substitution principle. Functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. Essentially it means that if you have parent class and child classes, you should be able to use those interchangeably. Um, you want to maintain your functionality and maintain your behavior within classes that should be related. Another way to show this is also back to the S3 storage class. So in S3, say we have to connect to AWS before we can actually upload anything. So now we have a connection uh, variable and we have a connect function, so we connect to a AWS and then we have a store function. So somewhere in our code, we'll call connect, and then we'll call store. So we'll connect to AWS, and then we'll store it. The problem becomes, now in our code, we're going to, in that for loop, we're going to have to do a little extra work. So if, it's a, if storage is an implementation of, or instance of S3 storage, we're going to have to call that connect. So this is not going to be maintainable, because if we come along, we have another storage implementation of they were pushing to an FTP server, also needs to connect, but a different connect function. We're going to have to do this <coughs> F plus another L statement, and it's going to become a long list of spaghetti code, and you're going to come back a year from now and not know what you're doing. So to get away from that, 
we are going to remove that dependency. So we're going to move the connection back to store. So store is the only thing that will need to be called. So we go back and then map generator again is no, lo no longer has that dependency. We're just calling store because that's really the only thing that we care about. So the next item is interface segregation principle. Clients should not be forced to depend upon interfaces they don't use. So the one thing you'll notice with all these principles, they're all semi-interrelated. So back to that storage interface. So if our storage interface didn't have, <coughs> we didn't start with file storage, we started with the storage interface in S3, and we needed that connection function, connect function. So in our interface, we added a connect function. But then we came along and wanted to store the file system. When we created that file storage store class, we have to make a connect function that really does nothing. So to fix this, uh, again, this is pretty simple, but remove it. So that that interface is just doing what it's supposed to be doing. The interface is totally focused on the one thing it needs to do, which is storing data. So it has the store function, it's all it really cares about. And the various implementations to get that store working rely on, fall down to the class of the actual implementation of that store. So S3 stores it one way, file storage is another way, FTP is another way, it's all different. So you let that fall to the, the class actually implementing the interface. So then you have dependency inversion principle. Extraction should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstraction. This is really about splitting the various levels of your code, the high level code and the low level code. So your controllers or views shouldn't be making database calls and your database layers shouldn't be spitting out views to the, the end user. So in this example, which I actually borrowed from Taylor Otwell, who developed Laravel and Laravel 4, uh, uses a auth class. So in this auth class, we have a database connection. It's uh, setting that database to a class variable, and then it's finding the user and executing a query. Now the problem with that is, what if we want to change something down the road? We don't want to use the database anymore. We want to use Mongo or Redis or somewhere else to pull our data from. We need to remove that dependency on specifically for that select statement. So we developed an another interface, we implement that interface, and then we bind it. So in this example, the interface is user provider interface, which has a retrieve by ID. So it's retrieving an ID. And then you have an implementation of that interface. So in this example, we're using Eloquent. So we have a class called Eloquent User Repository, which is using Eloquent to pull back that data. <laughs> but if we wanted to, say, create a Mongo class, we could say class Mongo, you can name it whatever you want, but say Mongo User Repository implements user provider interface. And we're guaranteed to get that ID back by calling this function, because we're implementing that interface. And then for Laravel 4, provides a nice easy way to switch those and bind that into your application by calling app bind. So we're binding, anytime we want to use that interface, it'll use this repository. So that means that if we want to change how our information is pulled or stored, we simply create a new implementation of our interface and then change the binding. That's all we would have to do to change where we're changing, where we're storing data. You could do whatever you want. Yeah, as long as you implement <coughs> that interface, and you want to do it, yeah, in some crazy file system, then you can you can do it. I mean, maybe like you know, so people can can follow better. Like if you can say a few words about what that bind. Does, oh sure. Because it's pure Laravel thing. Yeah. So for <laughs> for the the app bind, um, in terms of Laravel, you're able to bind different item or bind say say this interface, whenever you inject it, and let me go back to class. Yeah. Let's say this database connection, say this database connection is actually called database interface. So in Laravel, 
when it's constructing this, and say it's called a database interface, and somewhere down the line you have bound an implementation of that, Laravel will know to use what you've bound to that interface. So when you're coding out in Laravel, it will actually code out the using the interface. So this construct will be, say, database interface and the variable. So then in you could register it anywhere, but in Laravel terms, you'd probably put it into uh, global.php, which um, it acts as that binding mechanism. You could put it really anywhere. You can make a bindings file, which <coughs> I'll get to later. Um, and really, Laravel 4 is pretty <coughs> flexible, so you could really stick it wherever you want. But basically, it gives you that flexibility of uh, changing it down the road. Is that better? Uh, so essentially, it's kind of like it's specific to database connections. Or you can use it wherever. It's specific to, um, well, it's used for multiple things, and so not just mm -hmm. for classes, but it's not specifically for so database. It's just <laughs> a certain, certain interface. You, and just you, if you have an interface and then you have an implementation, that's all you need. It could The interface could be for anything, and the implementation could actually do anything with it. It's not necessarily for just for databases. It's not for not just for um, processing data or validation. You could really use it on any part of the application. Yeah, it's probably kind of more kind of clear once you kind of yeah. show the kind of use case how you're actually using it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Okay, so we bound that uh, the user, uh, the eloquent user re repository to that interface. So when this class is using th this class auth, you see in the constructor it has the user provider interface. What's actually going to happen there is it's actually going to use that repository so class. We'll that yeah. Repository. Mm -hmm. so, so that's going to happen in the background. So in fact, it will associate a class. Yeah. That <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also, with, since you're implementing that interface, you have to implement that retrieve by ID, so it knows no matter what version or what. Um, uh, what implementation of the interface, you're guaranteed to have this retrieve by ID. So no matter what you bind, so instead of saying eloquent user repository, we have say a Mongo user repository, it's guaranteed to have that retrieve by ID. All this class cares about is getting that data back. And it's going to do it by using this retrieve by ID. It doesn't care about the low level of how it gets that data, it just knows that it calls this function, gets that data, that's all it should care about. It shouldn't care about making database connections right now. <laughs> so I have a question. Is that, is the Laravel way to s always use interfaces? It That's depends. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that. Um, but the short answer is it, it depends. Um, if it's a very simple application, then the extra keystrokes may or may not make sense. Um, but it does gain you a lot of flexibility. So on a basic Laravel application, there's a few things once you get started with uh, Laravel 4. Um, one of them is you'll have to do, use Composer to set up the dependencies. Uh, you have to set up a couple file permission items. Uh, a couple directories need to be writable. Um, and then the routes folder and the views. With those pieces, you could create an application, a very simple application, but you could create an application <coughs> with just those few pieces. And yeah, sort of like kind of interrupting you a little bit so mm -hmm. we kind of give people more uh, kind of contact. So mm -hmm. Composer is kind of like a new packaging system for PHP that is kind of gaining yep. popularity lately. We just had a talk about it like, you know, a month ago, yeah. uh, but we'll probably have more like because it's kind of very useful tool if you have any. Yep. Yeah, uh, yep. Which is uh, where I'm going next. So we have Composer, which is a dependency manager for PHP. Um, it's not as mature as um, other languages, say for Ruby, um, but it is getting there. Um, and with that, you gain a lot of very useful things. You, by using Composer, it'll automatically pull down uh, the dependencies and the packages that you need and insert them into a vendor directory in Laravel 4. In this vendor directory, could be a few files, it could be a lot of files, um, and they're all pulled from package gist. Do you 
you still have to bind those to the application manually? Um, depends. So <laughs> the depends on the application. Um, you can use the files that are in the vendor folder. Uh, they're auto-loaded. So in a Laravel way, you could say, um, say there's a, let's see, what's an example? Say Sentry. Um, so Sentry is a user role management package. And in Laravel 4, you say Sentry, colon, colon, and then whatever function you want. So those, that piece of Laravel 4 um, would work out of the box. You wouldn't need to bind anything. The, the binding is really for the, the, the architecture step of it, the, the more high level architecture item. You can still do it in the Laravel 4 way, which is um, a little bit simpler, but less flexible, which would be hard coding those calls to the different classes. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so below this, you'll see uh, I did a git clone on the Laravel uh, project, went into the Laravel project, and did a composer install. Um, the composer install is what actually does the pulls down the packages and then also the dependencies of the packages. So it manages all the pulling in third party repositories for you. So it makes it very easy to include different pieces so you don't have to code everything yourself. Um, over on the right is an example of a more complex composer JSON file. So this is the one that it reads from to to pull down those packages. So this is just an ex that, that one's just an example of uh, what what it might look like. Um, you'll see in the require uh, section when you do an install, that's what's pulled down, and you'll see the name and then a version. So you'll have uh, say Laravel framework 4.0.star that would pull down the Laravel framework version 4.0 and then whatever minor revision that is. Um, and then the one below it would be Twitter Bootstrap, another project that would be pulled in and placed in the vendor directory. For that one, it's DevMaster, which is essentially just uh, a generic uh, version. So some of them may have versions, some may not. It just depends on the uh, package. And then on the bottom of that, you'll see uh, some auto-loading. So the bottom is actually specifying different folders that will be auto-loaded in your application. So here's a Laravel 4 base application layout. So you have the MVC items, the model of views and controllers. <coughs> then you have commands, database, and tests. So the commands folder is for command line tools. So you could do all kinds of cool stuff with this. Um, one extremely useful item would be to init your application. So you could write a couple scripts that would essentially build your application out. So say you're running in production or you had a big team and you wanted to have someone spin it up, you could write scripts uh, for the command line very easily using Laravel 4 to do that for you. So you could just say uh, PHP Artesian init. Uh, you'd have to define init but then you could boot up your entire application that way. So it can make development easy. Um, you could also use the command uh, folder to store straight migration scripts. Um, you could use it really anything related to the command line. And the database folder houses your migrations and uh, seeding folders. So this is another cool Laravel 4 item. The migrations are hold your schemas creations and alters, and then their version by time and date. So using the uh, that piece of Laravel 4, you can manage your database extremely easily. And there's also a seed folder, which seeds, seeds data in your database. So if you had, say, from that Trek weather site, say I had, uh, I needed to seed the data for the country list, I could write a seed for that. So that could easily run and then populate my database. And then the final two items are the public and vendor folder. Vendor folder is where the composer <coughs> packages are stored. And then the public is where your CSS, JavaScript, and image files would live. So here's an uh, example, or two examples, of a routes file in Laravel 4. 
So you see on the left, that's uh, the base implementation of a route. So what it's doing there is if it's the root, it's calling view make hello, which is hello is actually a template, uh, a blade template, and then it's displaying that. Um, the one on the right is a little bit more uh, detailed, I guess, <laughs> um, with different types of routes. Uh, the actual implementation of what those mean um, would be a good time to pull out the Laravel 4 docs, but most of them are pretty self-explanatory, so route git would be a git request, <coughs> route post would be a post request, um, route controller would allow your controller to be a RESTful controller, so any um, request that's made of it, it would try and figure out where that's supposed to go and then display the information back. Um, the views uh, use a templating language specific to Laravel called Blade. Um, on the left is just a generic HTML uh, page. It's the base uh, hello page. And then on the right is just a few examples of the Blade templating language. So you can extend, you can make sections, uh, you have simple uh, functions like if, if else, uh, or else if, um, and for each, and uh, pretty standard templating items. Um, it's not as robust as, say, something like Twig or Smarty, um, but it is uh, pretty powerful for what it is. Quick question: Is there any way to kind of substitute it? Yeah, you could. There's a. Uh, there's actually packages out there for Smarty and Twig, both. Would that be just like you bind something else instead of blade to them? Um, it's actually. Yeah, it's actually a little different than that. Um, there's a. There's different config files within Laravel that you could change to point to the different uh, templating language. Um, so it's actually a little simpler than the binding mechanism. Okay. Yep. Uh, so as for controllers, um, this is just a simple example of the welcome page displaying hello. Um, controls are can be fairly simple and should be fairly simple. Um, this one just has a public function show welcome and it's showing the hello. Uh, this uh, view colon make is, is going to display the um, the template called hello. Make sense? Okay. So then we're on to models. And this is where we're actually going to change how we're going to interface with Laravel to reflect that application architecture that we discussed earlier. So usually when you describe a model, it'll have multiple ands within that description. So you'll have a user model that is not only pulling from the database, but it's also doing some validation, and mm, maybe it's doing some authentication. So what we want to do is split that up into the pieces, so that we can replace the pieces if need be. So here's just another uh, view of the standard layout of a Laravel 4 application. So what we're going to do is replace that model directory with our own directory. It, it could still be called models, or it could be called, as I've named it here, my app. It could be called core. It could be called anything. Um, but what we're, what we're going to do within that is split up the what each class is supposed to do into its various components. So in this example, we have an extensions directory, a providers directory, repositories, and validations. So the repositories directory is pulling from the database or Mongo or the data store. The validations directory is handling validation. The extensions is handling the extensions of Laravel 4. So each piece of the of our, our my app is handling a different piece of our application. So there's a, a package out there that hand, that is that does essentially the administration part of a website. So it handles um, 
basically the administration part of a blog site. So post, comments, user management. Um, that's the link at the bottom, the GitHub uh, Daisy Laravel Bootstrap. So in that, he essentially does the architecture that we're discussing here. And so he has abstracts, accounts, blocks, galleries, post settings, validations, they're all split up into the various pieces that they're representing. Um, the piece we'll go through is uploads. And then you can see to the right, it might be a little fuzzy, but the piece on the right is doing that binding. So it's binding the interface to the repository, the piece that we're making. So we'll go through this upload. So the uploads.php isn't doing anything with the database. It's doing data manipulation, but it's not doing, it's not pulling data per se. So below that, then we have the interface and the repository. Uh, the interface is the guarantee and the repository is the implementation of that interface. So you'll see here, we have uh, uploads interface with various functions that we are guaranteeing to that application. And then we have the uploads repository, which is implementing that. So we have a git order, so we're using eloquent, so we have this order by git, so this would be a, a implementation of an eloquent um, uh, model where it's pulling back data using eloquent. Um, and then you also see that there's a save meta on the left and then there's also a save meta on the right. Um, the picture's cut off but it continues down and they all match up. So this uploads repository implements every function that's guaranteed in that uploads interface. <coughs> so that's when you're developing your application and all the code is new um, and it's new to the world. But then there's also, you may want to extend what Laravel 4 does internally for its core. And you don't want to go into Laravel 4's code itself and change things because if you update with Composer or you move to a different machine and do another Composer install, you're going to miss all those changes. So the better way to do it is to extend core. And there's two built-in ways to do this. So there's managers and there's the inversion of control container. Um, the managers are only specific to a few pieces of Laravel. And essentially that relates to the drivers. So the cache driver, the session driver, auth, and queue. So if you want to implement, uh, say, a Redis cache server or a Mongo or a memcache or something different than what's default to Laravel 4, it's as simple as writing a new implementation and changing the config file in Laravel 4. So there's a config directory with called session, and then you change it to your new new class, and that's essentially it. Um, because you're using that interface, it's guaranteeing all so those it has functions. To implement yeah. Some base interface. Yeah. So you have the interface, you're implementing that interface, mm -hmm. and so it's guaranteed to have all the functions that it is expecting. How does it know where to find the implementation? So there's a config file. A config file. Yeah. Oh, so you like specify where the file is. That, uh, uh, well, the file. file yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you'll, you'll well in the manager you'll essentially define what you call it, and then in the configuration file, whatever you've called it, you'll name that. Okay. So okay. say Redis or. Oh, and then it's auto loaded by Composer. Yeah. The, the files will be auto loaded. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It usually has like a. It has namespaces, so like, and it has the class auto load. So, uh, where you just, if you fall on any convention, it will just yeah. Uh, and it, and not all directories within your app are auto loaded, but if it's a new directory, then you can define that directory, and then it'll be auto loaded. Um, and so, when you're you're defining that new driver, then it'll 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 know where to go. It'll already be there. Uh, and then the other part is semi-related, which is the inversion of control container, which is providing service providers. So you can actually implement different things within your app, and then throughout the app, you'll be able to use them, uh, which I'll show in a second. So with, uh, this is a, a pretty blank service provider, but it has the four pieces that are mandatory. So you have defer, which basically decides whether 
the whatever you're defining should always be loaded or just loaded when it's needed. Then you have a boot, which is, well, when this class is, when the, the application's booted up, sh it should load these items. Uh, register, uh, registers the items within the app, and then provides is what it's providing to the function. Um, this example doesn't have anything in the register or provides, um, but it does show you what <coughs> would be uh, within that class. And there's a lot of great examples of this in use, uh, specifically within that package that uh, I mentioned earlier that's on GitHub. Uh, so if this is a little confusing and you want to dig in, uh, that would be a good place to, to go. Um, and then a short little spiel about testing, um, why you'd want to test your application, or why you'd want to have automated testing or use PHP unit. Um, the I have a list there, but in short, uh, it protects you from yourself. Uh, protects you from making a dumb mistake that affects somewhere else. Um, also, as your team grows and you know less of your application or le less of the whole picture, um, someone may re be relying on a piece of the application that you're not aware of. You change that small piece and somewhere else breaks, but you didn't know that relationship existed. So it goes to production and then something breaks in production. But if you have testing where the whole application is tested and you run testing, then that will come apparent as soon as you start coding that and you notice a bunch of errors in PHP in it, which also uh, Laravel 4 is, uh, has included. So there's a test directory and PHP unit is included and there's actually a fair amount of resources on testing, uh, specifically with Laravel 4. Um, I would get into it, but it's really a, a talk all in of, of itself. Um, so we have Mockery, which is a great tool for mocking different pieces of your application as you test. So if you're testing the controller, you're not hitting the database. You're faking that interaction. Because if you're, if you're <coughs> testing the controller, you don't want to also be testing the database. You want to test a very narrow piece of your application. Um, below that is getting started with Mockery. And the step below that is Codeception, which is a good uh, business-driven development tool. Um, also has an implementation with Laravel 4. So you can get up and running with that uh, quite quickly. Um, for the resources on Laravel in general, uh, as I mentioned earlier, laravel.com, laravel.io, um, and GitHub, uh, they're all are excellent resources for getting started and um, working on an application within Laravel. Um, and then there's a couple books. Um, in general, PHP Objects, Patterns and Practice is an excellent PHP book. Uh, old, it's, it, it's pretty old, but it's still good, and it's quite thick. Um, it's and then below that we have uh, Laravel from Apprentice to Artesian, which was written by the author of Laravel, uh, Taylor Otwell. A uh, great resource. And then for testing, there's Laravel Testing Decoded, which is written by Jeffrey Way, um, another very active community member. And that is it. What do you have for me? Or you all asleep? <laughs> yes, um, you could. Well, I could or probably send it to you. So or if you go to uh, andrewelkins.com, it's the. I just made a blog post with the link to it. So either way. Or you can tweet me. <laughs> Alrighty. Yep. Questions? Yeah. I just have one. The previous Laravel had bundles. They got rid of that. Got rid of that in favor of Composer. So it's packages. Yeah. So it's packages, um, and that gains a lot of things. So we're no longer tied to just Laravel bundles. So Composer is not just a Laravel thing. It's a PHP wide thing. So we can include packages in our Laravel application that aren't necessarily for Laravel per se. So it gains us a huge amount of code that we can use in our application. Um, a lot of flexibility, a lot of code reuse. Um, beyond that, if you develop something for in a uh, more generic way, then you're uh, contributing back to the community because they can use that within Composer, uh, whether it's Symfony or any other um, 
project that uses Composer. Do you know if it's easy enough, like with the view template changes, if you wanted to use Twig and stuff, but in the ORM, if you wanted to replace the ORM with like Doctrine 2 or something? Uh, there's packages out there to do that. I haven't done anything with Doctrine in Laravel 4, um, but replacing Twig is pretty easy. I've seen the test application you like load from GitHub and loads actual ORM Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doctrine side, I guess. Yeah, the, the next version gets rid of Doctrine. The only thing they use Doctrine for is to rename columns within the migrations. Um, so they're actually removing that dependency because it's a, a big yeah, chunk of code and it's a very tiny piece well, that it's using for. With the Doctrine, you have to be kind of careful because it's like such a monster, you know. Mm -hmm. like if you just have like fairly simple database objects, you probably don't really need it. Yep. Doctrine is like a, a very easy way to entangle yourself <laughs> to, to an extent and you just like, oh my goodness, just like pulling your hair, so I've kind of seen that quite a bit, so i uh, kind of be careful with that. Mm -hmm. It makes kind of things easier on the surface, but once you start getting visualization on it, it yeah. gets pretty... You can become hairy. Gets pretty gruesome. Alrighty, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>